Hello, everybody. Are you out there yet? My clock reads about two minutes before one, but my clock is off and wrong. What do you think of my hat? My clock is often a little wrong, so I figured I'd start a little bit early and uh, we'll wait to make sure everybody gets here. <clears throat> All two of you. <laughs> I just got an email on the other computer over there. It says, I'm on live now at my channel. So I guess they thought I didn't know. Well, if you guys are out there, let me know. Oh, hi, Bob. <laughs> um, hey, Russ, how you doing, bud? <laughs> Mona just chimed in. Hey, you're wearing your hair hat. <gasps> I didn't know. <laughs> huh. I wear my hair hat when I'm getting frustrated. I need to pull out my hair and I don't want to lose any that I have. So I just wear my hair hat for that. You got to do what you can do, you know. Anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, as I've said a few times recently, I'm not sure I'm going to keep doing this, this YouTube deal because, uh, for example, today I stopped what I was doing on my writing computer, which is this computer, the video and the YouTube and all that stuff works right on it for some reason. And it doesn't work right on the other one. So I switched over here. I even set it up on a cigar box so you could see me better. And right up there, I've got that picture. I think I talked about it before. That's a pencil drawing my son brought for me of uh, supposed to be Gus McRae and uh, Captain Call. But when he bought that for me, that's kind of what I had in mind for Wes Crowley and uh, his sidekick, Mac, too. So right across the top of that up there, you can't see it from, from where you are. But right across the top up there, I wrote, uh, it all started with Wes Crowley. And I just, I like to have that up there as a reminder. Man, I'm working on my 88th, I think, novel. No idea where the time's gone. No idea where all those words went. Can't make my beard go straight. Keeps trying to hook over that way. Anyway. Oh, let's see who we got here. Hey, Peter. How are you, bud? Thanks for stopping by. So how old are you, Peter? Talk to me. You got a hair hat yet? <laughs> okay, anyway, you'll see this again tomorrow in the journal very briefly. Um, I'm probably not going to keep doing these YouTube things at least regularly. But if there's anything you guys would rather, you know, hear me blather on about on here and watch and all that crap, uh, drop me an email, you know, drop me an email. I'm here to please, or you can leave a comment on the journal tomorrow because I'll say the same thing in that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about cycling right now. I just had a, a reminder today. My characters actually yesterday, my characters gave me a reminder of a third reason for cycling. 
you know, there, <clears throat> the first reason is just to go back over what you've just written and make sure that you stayed up with the characters and let them come back in, give them a chance to come back in while you're taking a breather off the side of the trail. Let them come back in and add in anything you might have missed. That's the primary reason for cycling. And then a secondary reason is, you know, I've used it many times, the example of Aunt Marge, here's a burglar in her living room and gets up in the middle of the night and puts on her robe and goes out to, to find him. And all of a sudden, you know, two or three chapters later, when she encounters the guy, all of a sudden she pulls a, a revolver out of her robe and holds him until the police get there. But the problem is you don't remember her ever putting that revolver in her robe. So where did she get it? So right then you stop, <clears throat> excuse me, and you cycle back to whenever she first got out of bed and you have her reach in the nightstand and get her deceased husband's revolver and slip it into her nightgown. Now you're good to go. So that's the second reason for cycling. The third reason, should I make you wait till tomorrow when it comes out in the journal? Anyway, I won't do that to you since you were nice enough to stop by. Peter is over the mid 70s, Mark. Well, hang in there, bud. Hang in there. Um, we'll, we'll see which one of us makes it to the finish line first. <laughs> if if we could count backward from the finish line, I might be, I don't know, 95 or something. I don't know. Yeah, by only a thread. You and me both. Hanging on and aging both, huh? By only a thread. Uh, the third reason for cycling is, was handed to me by my character. And my current character is T.J. Blackwell himself. Uh, this is not a guy you want to mess with. He's the guy who runs Blackwell Ops. And I figured a while back I'd go ahead and write his origin story. He popped up and said, let's do this. And I said, all right, because frankly, I'm scared of him. So we're writing his origin story. But. And this is something that plagued me when I was a younger writer before. And by younger, I mean only like 10 years ago. When I sat down and wrote my first two or three novels, this, this what I'm going to talk about here, kind of plagued me. But I was on guard for it back then. So it didn't bother me so much, you know. Uh, and what that is, is when I decide as the writer, I decide what would be better in the story. Uh, back then, I guarded against it, so it didn't bother me so much. Nowadays, not so much. It doesn't really crop up very often for me. But yesterday, I even panicked and wrote my buddy Russ and said, hey, you know, did I ever say anything anywhere in the Black Wallop series about when it happened? In other words, it could have happened right now in the current day, or it could have happened 10 years ago, or it could have happened 30 or 40 or 50 years from now in the future. So I ran with that, <clears throat> and I thought, well, since Blackwell Ops isn't dated in that way, I can go ahead and write T.J. Blackwell's story as if he had, because he's old, he's like, I don't know, 80 something or whatever. So actually, I finally figured it out. He was born in 1945, he told me. He and his brother, in fact, his, his brother was 13 when a certain event happened. And his brother told TJ, who was only nine, and this won't be in the journal tomorrow. His brother told TJ when he was only nine, he said, you and I are bookends. And for a long time, TJ had no idea what he was talking about, but he laughed, you know, along with his big brother, who was 13. And later on, he figured out what the brother was talking about. 
His big brother was born nine months to the day after after TJ and, and his dad left to go fight in World War II. Okay, that was your first bookend. And TJ was born nine months and three days after the old man came home from the war. So there's the bookends. They bookended, they bookended the their dad's participation in World War II. So that's how that came out. So anyway, TJ was born in 1945, so he's, I don't know, about 80, something like that. Peter said exactly. I'm not sure what he was <laughs> commenting on. Probably 80. I don't know. But anyway, the third reason to cycle is what TJ handed me yesterday. And it was frustrating as hell because I knew it all the way from the beginning. When I first started writing the novel, I, I did all that figuring on whether I had put any uh, whether we, the characters and I, had put any timestamps, you know, in the in the Blackwell Op series, decided we hadn't, so it would be okay to write TJ's uh, origin story with all the modern conveniences, with cell phones, with laptop, you know, all those kind of things that we almost take for granted nowadays, at least the younger of us do. So I did that. From the beginning, for my convenience as a writer, I sat down and started writing TJ's story. But for my convenience, I made TJ be born late enough <clears throat> so that when he was 25, 26, 30 years old, he could use laptops and cell phones and all those things. And that just isn't who TJ is. It just isn't. And I kept having this little nagging feeling in my gut the whole time I was writing, you know, 16,000 plus words of writing over five days, I think, if I remember right. And in all that time, I just kept writing, but I kept having that little nagging feeling in my gut that it wasn't right, that it just wasn't right. It wasn't TJ's authentic story. So yesterday, about noon or so, I just said, out of hell with it. I'm going to go back to the very beginning, to the prologue. I'm going to start reading through the story, cycling, and just let TJ put in there whatever he wants. So we started 16,000 words in the past and started just cycling through the whole story. So in a trial that happens early in the book, when it's over, instead of the reporters racing out of the courtroom to, to grab their cell phones and call in their story or email it in or otherwise text it in or whatever, they run out of the courtroom to pay phones to call in their scoop, which is what actually happened in TJ's world. And instead of relying on Google Earth, or looking up a map online on his laptop, TJ reads newspapers. Remember those? He reads newspapers and he looks in the society section for articles about uh, so-and-so's wife, what's she doing? And will so-and-so be alone when I want to go to his house and give him a lead additive, for example? So he reads newspapers and he reads the society page in newspapers and he refers to maps. He has an old worn out atlas that has Chicago spread over eight pages in that map, two pages for the Northwest, two pages for the Southeast and so on. So he referred to that most recently in the book. So that process of cycling back through that what was 16,000 words? I added about 1,400 and some words just cycling. And here I thought I was going to lose a bunch of words because there was a lot of stuff I had to cut out and just pitch it away. So 
so I was pleasantly surprised that uh, that I actually ended up adding words to it. I thought I was going to be operating at a at a deficit there for a while, and I hate that. I hate when that happens. So TJ and I are all up to speed, but it gripes me to no end that through my own stupidity, you know, bowing to that that. It wasn't even really critical voice. It was ego. It was me saying, I want to write it with modern conveniences. So that's what I'm going to do. And I did that for 16,000 words. And now the last two days, I'm paying for it. Instead of having a, a full, I don't know, eight or 10 hours of writing, I've spent that eight or 10 hours cycling. So don't do that. Don't be me. Don't be stupid. Just go with what your characters tell you. Go with what they give you. How you put it on the page is up to you. But don't discount your characters, folks. Don't discount your characters. I'll swear to whatever deity you want, it works. Uh, let the characters tell the story that they not you are living in your story you're right at the moment you're sitting wherever i hope with a cold beer watching me on this stupid screen uh in your story as a writer you're sitting alone in a room somewhere you know listening to your characters and making stuff up and that's fine that's wonderful but don't interject yourself into their story as if you're the one living it you're not that's one of the reasons we write right that's one of the reasons we write so we can see the world through their eyes so we can have the adventures they're having so we can at least witness them um you don't have to you don't ever have to if you've ever wondered what it's like to kill someone you don't have to wonder you don't have to go out and kill someone all you got to do is read Blackwell Ops or probably some Vince Andrews books. Oh, if he was here right now, he'd lean in and go, that's vinzandry.com. Okay, so that's Stone Thread Publishing, all one word, dot com. There you go. Just go in there and take a look, see if there's something you like, let me know. Not a problem. Or do the one click thing and uh, buy something. Eh, whatever. Okay. Let me take a look at my comments here. Michael Connolly talked about that problem with Harry Roach. No, oh, Harry Bosch. When he I think he wrote Harry Bosch, right? So he was talking about that problem with writing Harry Bosch. Oh, uh, White Knight, Harvey. You just temporarily forgot to practice what you preach. Yeah. No, I just got lazy. I always practice what I preach, but I just got lazy. I just got lazy. Hey, I'm like, uh, you know, if you believe the, the Bible Christian story about that guy, uh, Saul from Tarsus, becoming Paul, that's me. I used to outline. I used to rewrite. I used to revise. I think I've said before in the journal, I once spent three years outlining a novel. I still haven't written that novel. I was so bored with it by then. Why bother? I was bored with it a long time before then. I only finished, I, in fact, I didn't finish the outline, but I kept writing the outline because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. Because that's what all the big pundits out there preach. And eventually they, they go away. You know, most of them don't hang around. Some of them do. Some of them gut it out and keep talking about outlining and revising and rewriting and, you know, using beta readers and and uh, getting critique feedback from critique groups and all that kind of nonsense. But let me tell you something. Research is not writing. Uh, thinking about writing is not writing. 
going, throwing money at writers conferences and hanging out with people like me or whoever, that's not writing. You know, I'll take the free drinks all night, but that's not writing. You shouldn't be there doing that. You should be home writing. <clears throat> My favorite all-time poet's name was Howard Nemirov. Some of you know I used to be, uh, yeah, I was, I was pretty successful as a poet for a long time. And my favorite poet of all time was Howard Nimrov. You've probably never heard of him, but he was the poet lord of the United States twice. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize. He won the National Book Award, you know, all that stuff. But Nimrov went to, uh, I think it was University of Michigan, to give a talk. I don't think he attended there, but he went there to give a talk. And like almost nobody showed up. And of the people who did show up, he said, how many of you here want to be writers? And they all, you know, all 20 of them or whatever raised their hands. He said, then why are you here? Why aren't you home writing? Frost did something similar. Robert Frost. Like you needed me to add his first name, right? <laughs> Frost, Yates, and Emerald. That was my my uh, holy trinity of poets when I was coming up. But Howard Nemirov was just absolutely excellent. I used to write uh, not parodies of his work, but takeoffs on his work so I could study the way he wrote more closely. Anyway, I'm about out of steam here. Uh, anybody got any questions? Oh, yeah. Pattern. Patterson is crazy about outlining. Uh, you know, and I don't really blame him. I mean, the guy outlines the book. You know, he outlines the story and then he passes it off to some other schleb, schlep, whatever the word, schlep, to write it. Well, that's kind of the best of both worlds to me, because if I outline a novel, I've already enjoyed the story myself and it would bore me to tears to write it. So if I could outline it and get the story that way and enjoy it that way and then pass it off to someone else to write. Why not? And maybe he pays them a little bit. I don't know. I doubt it. His, his name's on the cover a lot bigger than theirs is. So maybe they pay him. I don't know, but you know, I couldn't do that. And that's why I don't outline. I just let the story unfold as it, as it goes. Patterson probably lets the story unfold as he's outlining it, but then he passes it off to someone else to write it. So he doesn't have to be bored with the details. You know, I don't know the man personally. I haven't talked with him, but that's what I'm thinking. As far as him being a massive, huge, you know, bigger than the death star, uh, bestseller. I personally put it all down to marketing. The guy was with J. Walter Thompson, you know, the United States' uh, premier advertising agency. And he started out, as I understand it, he started out as a copywriter and he rose to be the vice president or the president of the company. So he was around there a long time. You can't tell me he doesn't know marketing. And then you got schleps like me sitting around going, I don't want to market. I don't. I don't really care. That's one beautiful thing about being the, the young age, Peter, that I am, is I don't really care. <clears throat> I'm getting paid every day by enjoying the story. I love my characters, most of them. I love my characters. I love the worlds they're in. Uh, you know, you can, you can run and play with these people and everybody thinks you're working. Go figure. Now, if I could, you know, sell some movies, sell some licenses to movies or something like that. Sure. I'd take it. But my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, they're probably going to make money on it. 
That's fine with me. I've already been paid just by the sheer pleasure of doing it. Anything I make over and above that is strictly gravy. Anything I make over that is gravy. Uh, the only real work I do is what I'm doing right now here and the journal. And maybe occasionally I write a nonfiction book. That's work. Because, you know, I have to make sure I get my head out of my butt and explain to you guys, especially those of you who don't know as much as, as you would like to know, explain the things that I take for granted to you in a way that you'll understand them. Um, I think I'm a fairly good instructor, but that's for, you know, all you guys to decide. But in the meantime, that's the only work I really do. Now and then, if my bride's still on here, she'll probably get a chuckle. Now and then, she sneaks up on me and gets me to go do some actual work, you know, physical labor. Like, I hooked up a couple of new garden hoses I bought the other day. Went out and bought a couple of really good quality uh, 100-foot garden hoses. So now we got the whole area around the house covered with only two hoses and they don't kink. I bought some kink free hoses a while back and uh, no, that was a lie. So every now and then she gets me to do a little bit of work like that right now. Well, right now she's probably watching this silliness, but she's been redesigning and re whatever you call it, re the whole kitchen and, you know, she got new appliances in there, so now she's, because we're buying the house. So now she's been, excuse me, redoing the cabinets, and they're all mesquite, so they're nice. We want to keep them, but she's, you know, cleaning them and polishing them, and she's leveling things and, you know, nailing stuff and screwing stuff, putting all kinds of things together. And, you know, it's changed day by day when I go down to the house. But for the most part, I spend my time out here in the hovel because she doesn't come out here much, so she won't make me do stuff. That's why that, that's why that happens. Guys, she even takes the trash out to the curb now and then. Yeah, because I forget. You know, yeah. Okay, anybody got anything for me? Let's see. Goodwin Harvey. <laughs> I guess I guess she's still here. She said R O F L M A O. No, I hope not. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing Howard Nemirov to your attention. You're more than welcome. Nemirov is way up there. There's another one called Anthony Hecht. H E C H T. He's up there with Nemirov. He's he's right on up there. Uh, let's see. Joined a writer's group. The group leader went around the table asking each of us to read a part of their story. Yeah, I'll bet they told you how they would have written it, too. You know, I think it was Mark Twain that once said, no urge is greater than the urge of one writer to change another writer's work. And I think that's probably true. Patterson's crazy about outlining. We've been there, talked about that. Uh, I've never, you know, I've tried my best to really like Patterson because that other guy, Dean Wesley Smith, talks about him a lot, you know. And and uh, I argued with him a little bit and uh, one day and he said, well, read his early books, read his early so I read some of his early books, tried. I never was able to read one. But he doesn't pull me into the story. You know, there's he doesn't ground the reader. He doesn't do well on description. He doesn't do well on depth, which is one thing that Dean pounds into people. And rightly so. You need to have good depth. You need to pull the reader into the story. If you don't, you know, that's your fault. That doesn't go to reader taste. 
if you write a story that has good depth, good characters, uh, uh, characters the reader can be interested in if they want, you know, and so on like that, and you, you pull the reader to depth, you give them the description of the settings and the scenes and all that stuff, make the reader be an eavesdropper in the story. You want the reader to be in the story, standing just outside the scene, listening and watching what's going on. That's the ideal place for the reader. And if you can do that, and then and you do it in the right genre, the reader's genre, and if the reader still doesn't care for your work, that's reader taste. Okay? But if you write something in the reader's genre and they just can't get into the story because you don't pull them into the story, you know, that's not down to reader taste, folks. That's you. That's you, the writer, needing to hone your craft, write more. Practice, 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 and practice is putting new words on the page. That's all that is. Um, so anyway, if you don't have it yet, go take a look at uh, stonethreadpublishing.com slash writing better fiction. And there's a little, you know, if you want to put it straight into your web browser, it's stonethreadpublishing.com forward slash writing hyphen better hyphen fiction hyphen. <laughs> and then hit enter and it'll take you to the book page. You can read a description of it right there. And if you haven't done that yet, you know, and if you feel like there's anything at all wrong with your writing, you need to go in there and take a look. You need to go in there and take a look. When I when I said that's the only book you'll ever need about the craft of fiction writing, I meant it. I even had outside people come in and say, oh, you didn't talk about this. You didn't talk about that. Bringing up things that I generally take for granted because I do it all the time. So I went back and said, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. So I went back in and wrote another chapter or went back in and wrote a section in a chapter. So go in and take a look at it. And if you feel like it's not something you want, don't buy it. And if you feel like it is, buy it from stonethreadpublishing.com so you get a discount on it. We both make out. You spend less and I get more. See how that works out? It's wonderful. Keep me in hamburgers. I'd like to say keep me in hamburgers and beer or hamburger and uh either Beam or Jameson's Irish whiskey, but I'm not allowed to drink that stuff anymore. My doctor said so. You know, whatever. Anyway, I got to get out of here. I've been on this thing 33 whole minutes, and I think YouTube doesn't like it when you go over a half hour. So I will talk to you another time. If you want to keep seeing these kind of things on YouTube for some weird reason, uh, drop me a line, either in a comment or an email, and let me know. And, uh, you know, if the journal is good enough, is enough for you, I say pretty much everything I want to say in there anyway. So I'll talk with you next time. Bye now. Thanks for coming by. Bye now. <laughs>